going. Oh, hang on, didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that. Right. So welcome everybody. We're just giving you all a chance to join and then we'll make a start. We'll give you um, an opportunity to ask questions um, as we go through the presentation. We'll ask you to put your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, please. Um, that's the way of communicating rather than via chat. So I noticed we've got somebody with a raised hand, but if you can pop your question or concern into the um, chat button, then we'll be able to respond to you. Right. How are we doing numbers wise, Lisa? Looking good, still going up. No, okay, don't give it a couple more minutes then. And then I'll do introductions. I mean, hand over to Peter. Right, so, oh, struggling with this. I need you to answer the chat, Lisa, for some reason I can't. That's right, I'll do that one. Yeah, okay. Right, have we got any issues that we need to resolve before we press on? I think we're looking good, numbers okay. are steady. So can I just remind people, please welcome everyone. Um, if you could, if you've got um, communications questions for us, pop them please in the Q&A, not in the chat function. Um, it makes it easier for us to respond to you. So in the questions answers at the bottom of the screen, rather than the chat function, please. We are going to disable the chat function um, so we can use it for the presenters. So I see we've got a lovely large number of people joining us this afternoon. So. Kia ora, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jane Morfitt. I'm the COVID Clinical Education Manager. And it's my privilege and pleasure today to be joined by Professor Peter McIntyre, who's one of our Immunisation um, immunization Advisory Centre Medical Advisors. And he's got a wealth of experience having been working in the field of immunisations for over 25 years, uh, primarily in Australia. But to our um, delight, he joined us in 2018 and uh, we definitely were keen to have him uh, come and work alongside us as well. And he also works uh, with the World Health Organization on vaccination issues. And then I've got Lisa Sellers with us as well, who's helping me with the IT side of things, answering the, um, sorting out the questions and the chat um, side of it. And she's um, one of our education, um, immunization education facilitators from the Bay of Plenty. So welcome everybody. Uh, this is the webinar on um, COVID vaccinations and the evidence around booster vaccinations. We will play the um, webinar first and then you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So please pop your questions in the Q&A button and not in the chat bo button. It makes it easier for us to keep tabs of which questions we've answered and which ones we haven't. Um, and you'll notice on our website next to the webinar page, there's a link to our refer, um, reflection document. So if you want to count the hour account professional development time for this hour on the webinar, feel free to download that form, pop the details of this webinar in there and a small reflection, and then it can go in your uh, professional development portfolios. Right, so with no further ado, unless there's any issues that, um, I see we've got a lot of questions in, a lot of comments in the chat box, Lisa, is there anything urgent? No, it's mostly, um, mostly just um, welcomes and hello and um, where they're from. That's fine. So okay. no worries. it's all looking good. That's grand. So I'm going to hand over to um, Peter, who will do the main content of the webinar, and I'll touch up with you. Uh, I'll um, catch base with you at the end to do the practical issues around things like CIR and consent forms and such like. So over to you, Peter. 
Oh, thanks very much, Jane. I, I suspect for a lot of the audience that your presentation will be the, the most important bit, but um, I'll just try and lead into um, what do we know about um, boosters um, at the moment, and I can already see there are some interesting questions. So next slide. Um, uh, I think uh, one thing to be clear about um, right at the beginning is that um, you know, breakthrough infections, which I guess is our our main reason for being interested in boosters. Um, in other words, uh, infections occurring more than 14 days after your second dose are, for the most part, mild. So next slide. And uh, you can see that um, on this uh, on this graphic from Ontario, where uh, I guess. Um, unhappily for them and happily for us, they do have um, a lot more cases of COVID. So um, looking at um, firstly the, num the, the incidence of um, just any infection in vaccinated people, we can see that that's um, uh, around 22, so still only you know, less than a fifth of the incidence in unvaccinated. So Jane then is the next button down. Um, My apologies, Peter. That's okay. IT issues. Yeah, okay. So that's just point. And then uh, the next button, um, I guess, highlights just how much less common um, illness sufficient to be hospitalised or in ICU is among vaccinated people. And in fact, when we look at severe COVID in general, which is that hospital ICU end of things. Um, the, yeah, no, next slide, that's fine. Um, the, um, uh, it is overwhelmingly composed of, of older and sicker patients when we look at um, um, the severe end of things. Although what we hear a lot about um, in the media, the news generally is infections, which are primarily um, in younger people and aren't causing hospitalisation or ICU. So um, in particular, um, this group of immunocompromised patients with weakened immune systems, so um, transplant chemotherapy and so on, um, there's a little bit more information on the next slide about them. So if we just go to the next slide, Jane. Yeah, so this is some, some quite recent uh, data, um, which includes what's been happening since Delta came along in the US. Um, and it's from quite a large um, hospital network um, across the US. And um, amongst this group of hospitalized patients, they had almost 70,000 um, who were not immunocompromised, but in fact, um, about a third or a little bit under a third um, of that number who were in fact immunocompromised, which is obviously a lot more than we'd expect from the number of immunocompromised people um, in the community. Um, and importantly, over half the immunocompromised hospitalized people were fully immunized as opposed to only 16% of the, uh, the non-immunocompromised. And when we look at the different groups, um, solid malignancy, um, a malignancy, a hematologic malignancy, so lymphoma, leukemia, um, versus um, non-cancer conditions, so rheumatological conditions for the most part, where um, you're receiving some kind of immunosuppressive drug um, and other causes of immunodeficiency, um, you can see that all of them in the, in the red box have a substantially lower vaccine effectiveness, where obviously a hundred's what we'd like. Um, and this is comparing this group with a whole range of immunocompromising conditions against the unvaccinated. So, so we're still doing better than the unvaccinated, but once we get down, particularly to this last group where you've had a, a bone marrow transplant or an organ transplant, um, it, it's obviously not where we'd like to be, only around that kind of 45% mark. Although for other categories of immunocompromised patients, it's better, um, but um, it's, and this is just looking at the Pfizer ones because in the US, they also have Moderna. Just looking at the Pfizer ones, um, you know, it's better than that 45%, not as good as we'd like to be. And so this is the rationale for saying in this group of immunocompromised patients, uh, an additional dose, not just sticking with two doses, but giving an additional third dose at least eight weeks after the second dose 
uh, makes a lot of sense just because um, a number of these people we know now are not going to have responded adequately to that second dose. So moving on to the next slide, um, Jane. Yes, yeah, so this is um, also a relatively recent study from October that appeared in the New England Journal. And it's just a very small number of um, participants from the original trial of the Pfizer vaccine. And what it's doing is taking um, the um, uh, a fairly small number, 11 in the, in the 18 to 55 age group and 12 in the older 65 to 85 age group from the original trial. And looking at what happens, this is not immunocompromised people now, this is people in the original trial who were not immunocompromised. Um, and if you look at just this quite small number, you can see that um, the, the sorts of um, levels of antibody, um, this is the neutralization theta here on the, on the y-axis, the sort of levels of, of, of mean levels of antibody um, that we were getting um, to the original um, you know, SARS-CoV-2, the Wuhan strain compared to Delta, um, look about the same actually, not, not a really big difference, but um, importantly, which is good, you know, so not a real issue in terms of, of efficacy against the Delta strain once you're vaccinated. But after you receive a third dose, it does go up dramatically. So something like five or six times um, the level of antibody being seen after the third dose compared to what was seen after the second dose um, and retaining that level of protection against Delta. And uh, importantly, and perhaps somewhat surprisingly, um, in this older stage group, despite the fact that they had lower levels of antibody after the second dose, actually they get <clears throat> very similar levels of antibody after the third dose to, to the, younger, um, the younger group. So this is, you know, very small numbers, but even with these small numbers, um, significantly higher. So it certainly seems that after that third dose, you do get a really big bump in antibody. So next, um, next slide, Jane. Um, and now this is focusing in more um, on the severe group. So, uh, a study from Israel where they're just like New Zealand only using the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and so what this study shows, I'll just take you through the table, um, is looking just now at people who've been hospitalized and looking at them according to three different age groups, the 16 to 39s, the 40 to 69s and the over 70s, and looking at them according to whether they had coexisting conditions, either none, um, one to two or a lot, you know, three or more. And so looking at the 16 to 39s first, you can see that the, the risk um, is quite a bit lower than the 40 to 69s. So just the next, uh, but then compared to the over 70s, you know, it really bumps up. So um, something like 20 times higher in the over 70s compared to the under 40s. And then if you look at people with a coexisting conditions, um, almost 50 times higher um, for, um, this is you know, all the different age groups. Next, uh, next slide, yeah, so just push that one. So in the, um, sorry, back Jane. <laughs> it's, 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 it's difficult when you're doing someone else's slides. I'm sorry about that. Um, but just making the point that, you know, a sort of 80 fold difference between the over 70s and the under 40s and, and uh, if you add in the comorbidities, you can see that once you get to hospitalised patients as opposed to anyone, um, you know, really important to have uh, the booster in this group because you can cut the, the, the rate of um, these severe infections in the older age groups and groups with comorbidities, you can cut it down really um, dramatically um, with the booster. So, so getting something like uh, a 90 percent um, effectiveness of the booster against these severe outcomes in people who you know are the most vulnerable groups. So next slide. Now just and the next slide. So just to put this in a little bit of perspective, this is a nice graphic that the Financial Times came up with and you can see it is quite um, quite recent so up to September this year and a lot of you will have read about you know what happened with Israel getting this big bump up in cases um, uh, about sort of 
seven, six or seven months into their rollout. But you can see that um, even when you look at, you know, total cases that the unvaccinated are really driving most of this. Um, there are quite a few breakthrough cases in the people who've received two doses. Um, but then you do see a decrease in cases uh, with the booster. But if you look across here at just the severe cases, um, it's almost all um, the uh, unvaccinated and the ones in the two doses, as we've seen from the more detailed data in the last slide, this looks worrying, but actually it's all driven by these people who are either, you know, in the very oldest age group or have comorbidities or both. So next slide, uh, Jane. Um, and this is um, also very recent data from the US just with the first about 11,000 people um, uh, participating in this sort of active surveillance where they all get texts after they've received a dose and they respond to say, did they have a problem, did they not? Um, and out of this um, 11,000 group, you can see that compared to the percentage reporting, you know, local reactions or systemic reactions, that the proportion who are, you know, having to take time off work or, or you know, go and take painkillers or anti-inflammatories after the third dose looks pretty similar to what was happening after the second dose. So we already know that, um, you know, there are more uh, short-term side effects after the second dose with the Pfizer vaccine compared to the first dose. But important that after this third dose, which of course is coming along um, about six months after the second dose, that the rate of side effects is not any higher than what we've been seeing after the second dose. So that's good news. And um, next slide, I think that's, sorry, uh, oh, sorry I just had a, yeah. a couple of just quick summary po points before I hand over to Jane. So, so breakthrough infections, they're happening, but you know, the unvaccinated are still where the major issue is. Importantly, the severe cases of breakthrough are very uncommon and they're really particularly focused on the immune compromised and people you know, who are either you know, in, the, in the oldest age group or frail. Um, good news is that the booster doses, particularly for this um, group at risk of the severe disease are working really well. Antibodies really bump up very impressively, even compared to dose two, and safety is looking good. So um, there's lots more we could talk about, and hopefully we'll have time for questions, but I'll pass on to Jane for the important practical issues about how this is all going to happen. So thank you, Jane. Okay, thank you, Peter. I think people probably know a lot of the practical bits already, um, but I just wanted to just make sure everyone's really clear in their mind about the difference between the third primary doses um, and the booster doses. So the third pr primary doses are not the same thing. So we're boosting um, the immune system of those who are severely immunocompromised by giving them an extra dose eight weeks after their second dose. Um, these are off label. So at the moment, MedSafe hasn't approved the use of them for immunocompromised people, which means that you do need to have a written consent and a prescription. And I know this is causing some challenges out in the sector. So with these third primary doses, um, consumers are expected to discuss with their uh, GP, fill in a written consent form, obtain a prescription, and then either have the vaccine at that site or take the prescription and the consent form to a different site. Um, there's also uh, been updated guidance on how to log um, third primary doses onto the CIR. Now, Edwin did a, a webinar on the um, severely immunocompromised and who would benefit from these boost from these third dose vaccinations on the 3rd of November. So that's on our website if people want to listen to that. But there's just a couple of new bits of information that have come out since then that I wanted to flag up. So since we recorded that webinar, dialysis patients are now eligible for um, these extra doses, these extra primary doses. And also there's new guidance out there on how to accommodate biologics and immunosuppressive therapies. Um, and the dose thresholds have been removed to support more clinicians discretion. So it's become more a case of if you feel your patient is severely immunocompromised, then yes, you can um, 
sign the prescription and um, consent form for them to have an extra dose of vaccine. So putting that to one side, we then move on to the booster dose practical issues, which are actually much simpler. So the vaccine will be available as a booster dose from the 29th of November for anybody who has had at least six months since they had their second dose of vaccine. Eventually, those people that are currently having their third primary dose will also, of course, be eligible for a booster dose six months from when they had their third dose. But at the moment, we're looking mainly at those border workers, healthcare workers, and some of the um, older population who it's been more than six months since they had their vaccination. So for these patients, the vaccine has been um, approved by MedSafe, so there is no need for a written consent form or a prescription, you'll be very pleased to hear. And also we've been assured there's no issue with supplies, so there is no need to try and prioritise patients. In fact, there will be a natural prioritisation um, because of the way the vaccine rollout um, happened. Um, so we're, going, we're there to encourage healthcare workers, particularly in border workers, to um, access these booster vaccines from the end of November. And also, of course, as Edwin's pointed out, older people and those with medical conditions that put them at highest risk. Um, so really keen that we promote the vaccination, the extra booster dose for these people. But anyone who's had a, vac a second dose of vaccine six months ago is welcome to come and have a booster dose. The only exception to that is those who are pregnant. Um, and the current evidence is that two doses during your pregnancy is adequate to protect you and the baby. And so for pregnant women, we're recommending that they have their booster dose after the baby's born. And lastly, just to flag up some new issues around logging into CIR. Now, this is hot off the press, and it's one of the reasons why the rollout is not expected to start until the 29th of this month, because they are working behind the scenes on the CIR, sorting out the best way of recording booster doses. So for the booster dose, you'll need to load a new case. Um, it's a single dose schedule for the booster once the existing schedule is completed. So the existing schedule will be completed for most people with two doses. Those that are immunosuppressed, there's an option to include a third dose. Then you set up a new schedule. And that is different from how you're logging the third doses for the immunocompromised at the moment. They are going on, on the same schedule. So this is a new schedule. Um, you will have an option to select the type of vaccine that's clinically appropriate. And this is because there is now an option to include AstraZeneca, which also you'll be starting to be able to give from the 29th. Now there's detailed guidance on how to do this. I am not an expert on CIR, and that guidance is due out tomorrow. I was hoping we would have had it for today. Um, and I've been asked to remind everyone that your nominated site super users have already been briefed and are ready to coach your teams. And also to remind you that there is a drop-in session every morning from 9.30 till 10.30 um, to support CIR and book my vaccine. And you can just join that. We'll um, add the link um, to our website as well there too. And we will um, also put on our website the guidance, of, guidance sheet on how to use CIR to book the boost of vaccines just as soon as we're given access to it from CIR. So it will be an alternative point of, of information. But generally, use your super users and um, drop into the um, workshops in the morning. Then you'll have a chance to talk through with somebody if you've got any questions about how to um, log things. Right, so that's my bit finished. So I'm going to hand over to Lisa and stop sharing this screen, which hopefully will help with my um, IT issues. Yeah. Right, OK, so questions Lisa I see we've had quite a few <laughs> it has been coming in hot and fast um so Peter the first question um is just around do you think we're going to be needing ongoing boosters and do you think this will be six monthly well uh, I think my answer to that would be that it's horses for courses so uh, that as I indicated I think it's that you know that oldest uh group that oldest sickest group which definitely will need ongoing boosters i think i think we've seen enough evidence to know that that'll be the case um, i very much doubt whether um, 
you know, going down to younger people who are otherwise healthy, whether that's going to be necessary, particularly if we're focusing on, you know, any risk to them of, of getting severely ill, which is already very low. So I think um, one of the challenges we've had with, you know, and it's been necessary because it's all been going so fast um, with, you know, vaccine recommendations has been a little bit one size fits all. And I think particularly with the boosters and as we get to get more information about that, we'll probably need to be a bit more, you know, selective about who gets what rather than just saying, well, everyone over 18, go for it. Um, but in the first instance, it's going to be simpler to just, um, you know, have a one size fits all. But I think we're probably going to have to be a little bit more, you know, selective as we go forward. Thank you. Um... So just around, um, can you use different types of vaccines as boosters? Um, so, you know, obviously if you've had a Pfizer course, can you use AstraZeneca or vice versa? Yeah, well, there's, there's quite a smorgasbord of vaccines to choose from, of course, if we, you know, travel across the world. Um, in New Zealand, there's obviously uh, until recently been no choice. Um, AstraZeneca is available primarily, you know, for more special circumstances, as Jane was mentioning from next week. Um, and there is no problem. Um, we do have, have data now from studies that have looked at mixing and matching vaccines. And the news from those studies has been good. Um, there would be no reason to have AstraZeneca rather than have uh, a three course of Pfizer. That would be what's recommended uh, unless you had someone who had a significant problem with their first or second dose of Pfizer, in which case you might be interested in looking at AstraZeneca, but that will only be quite a small minority. And just to add there, if you are mixing the schedules, you will need a prescription and you will need a consent form because, again, that's not part of the MedSafe recommendation. So, yes, it can be done if, as Peter says, if there's a particular reason, but it's not routinely recommended. Um, and remember, you will need your prescription and your consent form under those circumstances. And that'll probably be ongoing, Jane, because I can't see yeah. MedSafe um, uh, going into the business of approving various combinations. Of, no, they've uh, never done vaccines. that. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> so, no, I can't see that happening. So it'll be, uh, I think one of the things that's exciting on a kind of international basis is, you know, if you've got a shortage in a country that that doesn't need to hold you back from getting on with your program. So that's really good news, mm -hmm. you know, across the world, uh, but won't be something we'll have to worry about in New Zealand too much. I see there's also a question coming in here, which I thought we would get, can we start early? Well, we're not the vaccine police, it's the ministry that has set the, the timeline, the starting clock for the 29th of November. So we are promoting that. And also, as I say, I, I don't think the CIR is up and running yet to support it. So my recommendation would be that you wait till the 29th um, to start the vaccine programme uh, for your staff. I think it is primarily staff that are saying they want um, to start giving vaccines early. but if you've got a particular rationale for wanting to, you could, of course, always check with the, with the ministry and see if they're happy for you to have a special exemption to start early. Thanks, Jane. Um, just a couple of questions have come in, Jane, about um, the link to get the professional development um, for the people who have attended this course. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling slightly because I've got a new screen and it's not behaving itself at the moment. So I can't open the website and just double check exactly the wording for the uh, form. So perhaps Lisa, you could have a quick look and just see. It's on the webinar page and it's called reflection form. And so what you need to do is just click on the reflection form that then um, you can download and fill your details in um, uh, Well, basically fill the webinar details in a uh, quick summary of what you found that was helpful out of the webinar what you what actions you might take that are different i.e demonstrate that you've actually listened to the webinar and not just logged on while you got on with making tea and uh, then that counts as your professional development so we do that rather than just an automatic certificate being generated because you've logged onto a webinar. So if people are still struggling to find it, um, we'll um, sort the link out and add it in in just a moment. Um, and this was just around, Jane, you'll probably be able to answer this again. You talked a little bit about it, but um, would you like to record the third dose and see, they would like to record the third dose and see, I, I, has the software been updated to accommodate this? My understanding is that it's in the process of being updated um, and they're telling me tomorrow they will be, they've 
shown people how to do it on the testing system, but the whole point of having a rollout date of the 29th is to give people a chance to get the um, CIR up and running. So that is the other reason why we're saying don't rush to start the programme early. Great, thank you. Um, and this is just another one for you, Peter. So is there a difference in efficacy of the different vaccines in preventing hospitalisation, i.e. is one vaccine better than the other? Not for the serious outcomes. I mean, it seems like pretty much all the vaccines that have been looked at so far, and you know, I guess in detail, it's sort of up to double figures now with you know, large rollouts in various countries, all of them seem to be performing well against serious illness. There has been a bit of a difference in terms of just how high your antibodies are and protecting against infection. And the mRNA ones, including Pfizer, seem to be top of the pops there. But once you're looking at severe illness, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, uh, you know, blue sky between any of the vaccines. Great, thank you. Um, Jane, you're actually still sharing your screen. If you want to uh, stop apologies. it, then we'll pop up. That's all right. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. um, and uh, just another question here about, um, do you think that the booster vaccines will be mandated and especially for our healthcare workers? Uh, yeah, well, I'm possibly not the right person to ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I, think I, I, I think there's a whole there's a whole lot of issues around mandation and what will happen with that over time. So, so um, uh, I, I think you know we can be confident that there will be many health workers who care, care workers you know uh, that will be keen on that idea. Although I think it's also very early days. So, you know, given what we've seen with how high the antibody levels go after the third dose it may well be that they stay up for quite a bit longer as well. So I think it's kind of watch this space at, uh, at this point in time. Right. And certainly at the moment, there is no mention of them being mandated. So they're not included in the legislation that's um, currently in place. Great. Um, just another one for you, Peter. So um, how long after a stem cell transplant before it's necessary to have a third dose and the patient has um, just... Do they just have to wait for the six um, months for the booster? Um, you know, i.e. if it's at three years post stem cell transfer, should they be getting a third dose before then getting a booster? Oh, well, I think if you're in that stem cell transplant group and hopefully everything's gone well and, you know, um, things are still kicking along a couple of years later, you would still be considered to be in that severely immunocompromised group. Um, uh, I mean... Potentially, if your stem cell transplant has gone incredibly well, maybe you know things are better than that. But I would, I, I would assume the worst, and uh, I would uh, give the third dose eight weeks after the second dose, um, you know, eight to twelve weeks, because you just don't know whether your patient will be one of the ones that's had a good response or not. And I think better to be safe than sorry with that particular group because they are at high risk. Great, thank you. Um, and just a, there's a couple of questions that's come in here, just around um, what do you think is the optimum time to have boosters? Do you think we should be having them a little bit later than six months or, or right on that six month? And then I guess you already answered this before, but um, a, around the efficacy of how long that will last, which again, we don't really know. But Yeah, that's right. So I think the, I think the first bit, um, you know, if you're in that kind of non high risk group, so, you know, don't have other significant health conditions, aren't over 70 or certainly aren't over 50, then there's no rush. You know, I mean, uh, you may be very keen if you're a healthcare worker in Auckland, you may be very keen to get going on that and that's understandable, but there's, in, there's no rush outside that, that, those kind of specialized categories. Um, and so later, I would say if you're not in a high risk group is better really. And I think someone asked a question about what if I'm lucky you, if you're going overseas in the middle of next year, I mean, uh, it might make sense to be not rushing in now because you won't be going overseas for a little while. Um, so I don't think there's any rush and how long it will last. It all, it all depends against what. So if we're talking about protecting you against getting any infection um, for that, you need lots of antibody because you have to get the antibody into your nose um, to protect you against, you know, initial infection. Um, 
But, you know, it may turn out that that lasts quite a bit longer after the third dose. We just don't know yet. What we do know is you get very rapid protection against severe illness if you're in that high risk group. So important to get on with those people. Great, thank you. Um, and just a question here about patients had two doses of the Sinovac overseas and then one dose of the Pfizer in New Zealand. Do you think that they will be eligible to have another dose of the Pfizer six in six months time? So that well, I'd say they're in pretty good shape if they've had two doses overseas if they've had a Pfizer in New Zealand. So, so uh, they, at the very least, should be at the back of the queue. Um, but uh, I, I think they would probably still be eligible. Would that be right, Jane? As far as the CIR is concerned, they'd be, they'd be happy to accept them after six months? The CIR is now allowing people to book uh, to log the overseas vaccines as part of the vaccine passport. So I suspect not actually, Peter. I think what, if they're counted as fully vaccinated um, and the schedules have been up, are going to be updated. This is another thing that's coming in on, sorry, rephrase. On the 29th of November, there will be a function to be able to log overseas vaccines so that they go through onto my vaccine passport. So well, I think what the question was, Jane, was if you've come to New Zealand, you've had your Pfizer yep. after you, you know, if you wait six months, can you get another Pfizer? And, and, and will the CIR let you do that, do you think? Well, it depends on how it's been logged. If those two previous doses have actually gone into the system and been recognised, then probably not. Mm. If they haven't been logged in the system and just one Pfizer's in the system, then obviously, yes, they would be eligible. Right, but but in any event, not a rush for that person. Exactly, no. exactly. There will. <laughs> yeah, and there's another yeah. quick one here, a quick win here, which is um, just to confirm that it's the same vaccine, whether it's given as a third primary dose or a booster dose. It's the same dose of Pfizer vaccine. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Um, and just to clarify, so the booster that's given six months after the second vaccine, is it given on day 108 or a, or um, day 181? To be honest, what? I don't know. I don't know whether they're counting calendar yeah. months or actually weeks. Um, I would say it's a lot easier to count calendar months than you've got no doubt in your mind. I doubt you'll get an error for um, being one day out, uh, but certainly quality team do tend to do searches on vaccines given earlier earlier than recommended and such like. So probably easier to just stick to the months. It's probably a computer says no type of problem, Jane, is it? So yeah, exactly, which is why I honestly don't <laughs> yeah. know exactly yeah, yeah. how the CIR has been set up yeah. Um, yeah. or what searches they will be doing to see whether you've been good or not. <laughs> um, so just a question here about the third primary dose. What about people who may not um, be immunocompromised? compromised currently, but they were when they first received their um, Pfizer dose? Uh, well, I guess you'd need a bit more specificity about, uh, about the nature of that problem. Uh, the, if the question is about, you know, I was on a big dose of steroids, you know, a couple of months ago and I'm not anymore, um, then that might be okay, but but for other kinds of um, immunocompromising medications, less so. I, I mean, one of the things that I think Jane referred to in the updated advice is is that um, it's very hard to get all the categories exactly right, and 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 there isn't specific information for all of them. So, so I, I think the approach with people who may be immunocompromised is to be fairly you know, uh, permissive. So if you've got a concern and you think, you know, your patient may be immunocompromised and, and you'd like to be, you know, to be sure, then, you know, it's fine to err on the side of, of giving it if it's not strictly in the list. Um, no one's going to get too worried about that. What we don't want is people who are on, you know, steroid inhalers for asthma, for instance, you know, getting, getting extra doses or people who've been on a short dose of steroids for, you know, some other minor problem like urticaria. We don't want those sorts of people, you know, uh, being considered to need uh, a third a third dose. Great, thank you. Um, so just a question here. So why is a booster dose not recommended for pregnant women, especially for pregnant women who live in high risk areas, so low vaccination rates or unvaccinated household members? Um, is there any more risk for pregnant women getting a booster than the benefits? Well, I think we don't know. So I think, I think Jane, the intent of that slide was just to say, you know, you're pregnant for nine months and so the six months could be up during, during the period of the pregnancy. Um, 
and I think that's really directed at the fact that, you know, um, the majority of pregnant women are in that younger age group. Many of them will be under 30. Um, and uh, again, the, the booster recommendations in terms of speed of fall of antibody um, are quite age related. And so in that younger stage group, it's quite likely um, that, you know, at six months, you're totally fine. And at nine months, you're also totally fine. Um, so, um, you know, it's really just, I guess, um, not wanting to introduce any extra things in pregnancy where there's often concern to begin with. Um, but I think the thing, I guess, to come back with there is that it is really important to be fully vaccinated in pregnancy because we do know that pregnant women are at a substantially higher risk of severe COVID if they're unvaccinated. So, so that's the important thing. Um, and the booster is actually very minor for that, uh, for that age group, you know, and in with a previously healthy pregnant woman. Great, thank you. Um, so the boosters is just a few questions, so I'm going to get this answered live. Um, yeah. Around, is it just for people that are 18 years and over, or is it eligible to all people who are 12 and over, which is currently licensed for? Uh, well, I believe the current recommendation or the current eligibility is over 18, and I think that's a good thing because, um, you know, on the one hand, the youngest people are likely to have the most robust res responses and lead the need the booster least. And on the other hand, um, the youngest people are also, you know, if they've already got high antibody levels, they could be at risk of adverse events. Um, and things like myocarditis are obviously still rare, but they're more common in young males. And, and you know, we get to the point of, you know, particularly going under 18 where, uh, you know, the risk benefits starting to get, you know, um, a lot less impressive. And so I, I think it's very, very appropriate to be restricting it at this stage to over 18s. And, and my argument would be, focusing on the over 40s rather than you know that younger adult age group great thank you um so i just have here where is the link for the dose dose thresholds being removed for the third dose of eligible people that's actually ministry um website it uh, was in the slides i pulled up it uh, came out as communications yesterday from the ministry linking to their new um, document. And if I, if I share screen, I can find it. Bear with me. So coming back onto here. Right. Does that come out, come up or do I need to? Yeah, that's come up. Yeah. Okay. So it's this one on the um, Ministry of Health website under severely immunocompromised people will be a good search for that. Um, and as I say, the link came up on their um, communication they sent out yesterday. So this is dose thresholds for your immunocompromising medication, uh, yep. Jane? Yeah, yes, yeah. it's got all the details in there. There's, it's just, yep. I just did a screenshot of the top of the document but there's uh, lots of information and the updated guidance on immunosuppression. Great. Um, so we just got a question come in here. Um, where do we record and save the consent and script forms for the third dose for the immunocompromised patients? You're just saying they can't upload it to CIR. So does each practice retain them in paper form? And if so, how long do we retain them for? Okay, so that's up to... Uh, Theoretically, they should be uploaded onto CIR. So if it's a case of you aren't able to because you don't know how, then talk to CIR and they'll talk you through it. If it's an issue around the practicalities and scanning and such like, then you can come up with an alternative um, for storing information, but it's the same as any other medical record. So I, um, I believe for adults, that would be 10 years that it would need to be stored. Great. Um, and just a question that's come in and saying, although we don't need the consent form for the boosters, is there one available? Um, they're really handy for offsite clinics and rest homes. So um, yes, you can just use the normal consent form that we have um, and they can just sign it there. There wouldn't be a spot, a spot for boosters. 
Um, uh, actually, just, Lisa. <laughs> oh, really? Just to update you on that one, there will be. Um, there oh, is great. a new form coming out that will also incorporate AstraZeneca. Uh, so in the next few days, that will be available. We may be, uh, be able to mention it on the um, webinar tomorrow, uh, but it's just being finally signed off. So yeah, there's a consent form on the ministry website, which you can use. Just be aware that it might be updated. So don't print out millions of copies of it. Um, you might want to to just be uh, frugal on your printing until you get the latest version. But that would just be for the booster for AstraZeneca, not Pfizer? It's for any vaccine. Or for any. Okay, yeah, great. It covers both. It's a generic form. Um, and just another question here. Can um, If someone chooses to get AstraZeneca for a booster, if the primary course was Pfizer, um, what... Uh, if they haven't had a reaction and they just want it for the booster, is that okay or do they need to get a script? They still need a script and they'll st still need a consent form because they need to be aware of the potential risks and benefits. But yes, it's okay. Um, AstraZeneca will be available if people choose to have it in preference to the um, Pfizer vaccine. But it's not the vaccine of choice um, for the booster doses. Great. And if there was a big rush on AstraZeneca, that might be a problem, Jane, I guess. Yeah. There might be, but but I suspect we've got enough at the moment um, to accommodate that because we're getting 10 doses out of each vial. So it's only certain sites that will be giving the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, I'll go through all the details of that on the webinar tomorrow. Um, and just a question here about um, do we know which um, is the preferred booster, the AstraZeneca or the Pfizer um, for New Zealand settings? Well, I think the answer to that was that the, the preferred one in New Zealand is is to have mm -hmm. Pfizer and to have the boost with the same vaccine that you had initially. I, I mean, th there is some some data from the um, from some overseas studies to suggest that there might be some interesting immunological advantages if you had AstraZeneca first and Pfizer second. But but to be honest, that's more like as in, it's interesting, but I don't think we've got anything concrete to hang our hat on. And um, definitely what would be being recommended at this point in time is you had Pfizer first, just keep going unless there was some significant problem with the um, you know first or second dose of Pfizer. And then I guess it leads on to a few other questions that have come in. So if you had one that's Pfizer, one that's AstraZeneca, what do you follow with with the boosters? Uh, well, if that was me, I would have the third dose as Pfizer, um, but uh, and that would certainly be more straightforward to do. Um, to be honest, I think the, you know there would be a theoretical recommendation to say if you had your first two AstraZeneca, have your third one as that as well, but but that I don't think is is essential or necessary, and I would be very comfortable if I'd had two doses of AstraZeneca to have a third dose of Pfizer. Great, thank you. Sorry, I'm just going through some no, of these. We should have the had double, more the on duplicates. There's a lot of questions. So, um, did the studies discuss um, or include Indigenous populations? And what are your thoughts? Are either booster for vulnerable populations versus aid? So, uh, no, they didn't specifically, but the good news there, if people haven't heard about it on the webinar, is that there is a, uh, a very important study being done by the Vaccine Alliance of Aotearoa New Zealand, where they have specifically recruited, um, you know, larger numbers of Maori and Pacifica um, uh, people into a study looking at the responses to the Pfizer vaccine and they've got you know in total like three or four hundred participants so there will be I think quite soon the first lot of data coming out uh, about the antibody responses we of course would expect that they would be just as good in Maori and Pacific um, people as as they have been in in the overseas studies but we'll actually have some homegrown data to show that very shortly. Great. Um, and I'll ask, I'll ask this question. Can pregnant women who get a booster shot who were fully vaccinated before they were pregnant, so they've had their two doses, now they're pregnant, should they get their booster dose? 
Yes, well, that's slightly different to the original scenario, I guess, isn't it, Jane? Uh, it that, is, I yeah. mean, if it, I mean, if it was some time back, uh, I think, you know, I think a single dose is fine. Um, let's say, you know, you you had it in May and you're, you know, twelve weeks pregnant in December or something. Um, I think that's fine. I, I mean, well, the, the, one of the things which is going to be interesting going forward, um, and fortunately, is not a problem we have in New Zealand at the moment, is. Um, uh, it is for the mother to a little bit like flu vaccine in pregnancy have the um, have COVID vaccine at that kind of third trimester point you know 30 32 weeks and um, that will probably turn out to give really good protection for the first three or four months to a newborn um, which you know would be a nice additional benefit but we don't have a lot of you know data about that just at the moment great thank you um, and so if, if patients have received the Pfizer vaccine overseas, the two-dose series, and then they're coming here um, mm. and they're boosting with the Pfizer vaccine, um, even though they weren't, um, they didn't have their primary course here, do, do they need a script for that? No. No, the script is simply there if it's a mixed schedule because of the issue with it not being, um, at the moment, MedSafe approved to mixed schedules. Great. Thank you. Um, Okay, so we've talked about, I'm just... Uh, yeah, I'm just sort of going through. Offers. We've gone, got, uh, working our way through. Um, can Pfizer be given as a booster dose for if Janssen or Moderna were given as a primary course? Yes. Um, mm. Christmas functions? Oh, the risk if one person is not vaccinated at a Christmas function, Peter, compared to everybody <laughs> that is. <laughs> That's a very topical one. I, I, it's uh, probably but, not relevant well, to this. But, well, I mean, I guess it's uh, it's still low, right? So the the absolute risk of a individual, you know, um, having an infection that you don't know about, is still very low. But obviously, if they're unvaccinated, it's uh, uh, you know it's a preventable a preventable risk. And obviously, you know, we, we want to um, you know do all we could to get that person vaccinated. Uh, the question of you know should they have a big red mark on their forehead or um, have to um, you know stand outside in the rain. I don't know. I mean, that's that's something which the function organisers uh, need to think about. But um, you know, I can certainly see some problems with that. Uh, but but I, but it's not really something you can quantify easily. Great. Okay, I'm just typing answers to a couple of these that aren't quite so relevant. Um, the gap between, we've had a couple of people um, asking why, um, uh, uh, why we're saying six months and can they give them earlier? So our recommendation is not to give it earlier, but we have had a comment back from a, somebody who's had discussion with a super user who's been told that it's 183 days rather than the monthly count. So there you go, that's an answer to that one. Thank you very much for that information. Um, I always learn something new. So if people have had two AstraZeneca abroad and then have a Pfizer here, yes, they should have a prescription um, for that. I know in reality that doesn't always happen. We have been saying that people are eligible to for Pfizer vaccines if they've started vaccine programs abroad. Um, but it is a mixed schedule. And if you're aware that it's a mixed schedule, then the recommendation is that you would have a consent form and a prescription. Right, and I've just got another one here for Peter. Oh, where's it gone? Um, given the data you showed in the early small study on immunocompromised persons and how their antibody response um, was so much higher and sustained after the third dose, do you think that um, the optimal primary series for immunocompetent um, might actually be three doses? Well, again, that's um, something that I think we're learning about. Um, it, uh, it, it could turn out that that... Um, that that becomes just you know routine in the future, but but I guess the um, you know the program is so far reaching. I mean, as everyone knows, we could potentially be seeing children as young as five receiving um, two Pfizer vaccines. So um, you know it won't be um, you know a major consideration for quite a while because everyone will be in the situation, or or almost everyone will be in the situation of you know having already had their primary series and 
and becoming eligible for the booster on the basis of that. I, I, I mean, I think there is an interesting point as to, you know, how, how much sense does it make to be having your second dose at three weeks? Um, and I would say not much sense because, you know, um, with all the other vaccines that we give, you would typically have a longer gap. The only reason it was three weeks to begin with was because everyone was trying to rush it. Uh, and of course, that's been part of the kind of rationale in Auckland as well. You know, let's just get that second dose in as quickly as possible. But if you're just interested in getting the best antibody response, you would wait longer than three weeks between the first two doses. Great, thank you. Um, and just a question here. Um, for immunocom immunocompromised patients, do they still need to bring the prescription form or um, will it no longer be needed after the 29th of November? Um, and, recording the, and recording the process will be the same as the booster vaccination. No, no. Okay, I'll answer that one. So um, we're hoping that MedSafe will approve the third dose and that once that happens, no, you will not need a prescription, but there is no light at the end of the tunnel in the short term. So it's certainly not the 29th of November. You will need to continue to have a prescription and you will need to continue to log it as part of the first series of vaccines as a third primary um, vaccine. So you'll continue to log it in the same way. You'll still have a consent form um, for the short term anyway. Long term, we want to get rid of the need to have the prescription um, and the consent form, but uh, the logging of it on the CIR will remain the same. Great, thank you. Um, and just a, another question coming in. DHBs are requesting a third dose if their staff have had two primary doses overseas of a vaccine, um, the Sinopharm, and the DHB doesn't recognise that vaccine. Is this okay to do? Okay, what I would say is uh, booster doses after six months are fine. It's probably no harm in having the extra dose, but from the 29th, more doses, more types of vaccine will be recognised by the CIR. So there is more work going on behind the scenes on that. And also from the um, vaccine order point of view in terms of recognizing vaccines that have been given overseas. So uh, I would suggest you wait a couple of days until that guidance comes out. Great, thank you. Um, so in the essence of the immunocompromised will be getting or slash allowed four doses, the fourth being recorded as a regular scheduled Pfizer vaccine. If an immunocompromised person wants to switch to AZ, what will the process look like for that? Okay, so immunocompromised get their three doses in their first uh, vaccination event, and then in their second vaccination event, they have their booster dose, same as everybody else would, and then you'll have a choice of whether you log it as AstraZeneca or Pfizer. You will get the choice of AstraZeneca or Pfizer for the third dose, um, primary dose as well in the near future, as soon as the system set changes over. Great, thank you. Um, and this is just a question, maybe you can answer this one, Jane. Thoughts around aspirating when giving vaccines, oh. not policy in New Zealand <laughs> and WHO guidelines. I know, but some countries are doing this rationale. Why and why are we not doing this? Okay, so just quickly, we have put um, a comment about this on our website and we have covered it in the toolkit as well. Um, there is some very slim evidence at the moment um, that it if you were to inject Pfizer vaccine directly into the tail uh, vein of a mouse, um, you might uh, at a higher dose than vastly higher dose. Um, it has been shown that um, the mice end up with um, problems with their hearts. And so some people are saying they would not, they don't want to have a vaccine unless we aspirate beforehand to ensure that there's no chance that the vaccine can get into the blood supply. Now, the evidence on this trial is very, very small, um, and it's something that no doubt is being looked at elsewhere in bigger scale studies. It is certainly not um, something that we would change World Health Organization best practice for vaccination based on, but if anybody would prefer the vaccinator to do that, that's absolutely fine. You just draw back slightly um, on the needle once you've inserted it. Um, most nurses are used to doing that anyway when we're vaccinating in other sites like the um, gluteal um, muscle. You do that just to check you haven't hit a blood vessel. So there's no harm in doing it. It takes a little bit longer. It's a bit more uncomfortable for the patient, which is the main reason why we don't recommend it. Great. Thank you. Um, so CDC has published a booster vaccine combinations. Will IMAC or MedSafe be giving us guidelines on what this is? Um, Pfizer for two doses or what vaccines can be given over versus overseas doses and boosters? 
So it's just a, that mixed scheduling again. Will we be posting up something around that? Well, I think at the moment, our schedule is that you use um, Pfizer as the vaccine of choice, unless there is a contraindication to it, in which case you can use AstraZeneca. Um, I don't think we'll be doing much more on that because they are the only two vaccines we've got and we've got a limited supply on AstraZeneca of AstraZeneca. I, the, the, I think what the question might be about, I'm not sure, and Lisa and Jane, is that they might be asking about various combinations of of overseas yeah. vaccines. Um, I, I mean, you know, some countries, and the US has been amongst them, have been very restrictive about what they'll accept and what they won't. Uh, I think New Zealand has gone in the right direction by being, you know, um, uh, inclusive or permissive about, you know, basically if you've, you know, received an appropriate course of vaccines overseas, then that's accepted. Um, and uh, it's really only been the situation with, um, border workers and healthcare workers where there's been a a requirement to have an additional dose of Pfizer otherwise for people in the general community they've been happy to accept whatever has been previously given and I think in relation to boosters for someone like that um, the policy would also be um, doesn't really matter very much what you've had overseas whatever that might have been um, having a single Pfizer as a booster here should be totally fine but we may not have, you know, 10,000 patients to point to uh, evidence for that. But from first principles, it should be fine. Great, thank you. Um, and just got a question here. Um, where is the link for dose thresholds being removed for? Oh, no, you answered that one. Sorry, Jane. I did, yeah. You just need to remove it. <laughs> um, is it detrimental to give three or four doses to someone who was not immunocompromised at the time? Of the first or second dose. Okay, so that sounds like if, if it's been given as an error, um, we're gradually getting more evidence on um, doses that are given too close together or inadvertently um, extra doses are administered. It's certainly not recommended. It would need to be reported as an error and it would need to go through to CALM. Um, there is limited data uh, on problems, uh, but I would expect there to be more localised reactions, possible um, adverse reactions, would you, Peter? Yeah, well, well, there were some early studies when Pfizer was trying to work out what dose to give, where they were giving people 100 milligram micrograms, which is more than three times the current dose. And, and I think those people were more likely to get sore arms, etc. But, um, you know, none of them, albeit in small numbers, had any major problems. So, so I guess, you know, we keep our fingers crossed that it'll be good. Um, but we, as Jane was saying, would uh, do our best to avoid it. Right. I'm right. conscious that we're tight on time, Lisa, so shall we perhaps try and keep to um, those questions that are particularly relevant to the webinar topics? There's a few that are a little bit off on tangent, which is great. We're always happy to, to take questions and you can send them through to us um, um, and we will respond. Um, do, do, there's just a question here, on. Jane. Do you um, know when the booster consent form will be available? As I say, it might be available for us to share on the webinar tomorrow, but certainly within the next few days. Again, they're working to a deadline, uh, to a timeline of the 29th of um, November. So uh, it may be a few days yet. They may decide they want to do some more editing on it or something. Great. There's a question here about uh, um, administration is there administering training for the AstraZeneca through IMAC? Uh, we are doing webinars on that and we will be doing, we've got resources and we've got online training on AstraZeneca. So um, as I say, we're doing a webinar tomorrow. So we'll answer questions on AZ tomorrow. Um, is it detrimental to give a third primary dose and then a booster six months later to somebody who's not immunocompromised at the time of their second two doses? Um, well, I think we've talked about that already. We right? have, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, if someone had had a reaction to their second dose, um, would you advise them to get a booster? Well, I think the answer to that is it depends what the reaction was. So, so, so if someone had had, for instance, um, myocarditis, then um, it would, um, you know, be a, an individual risk benefit discussion with that person, I think, you know, something significant like that. Um, if it was a case of, you know, I felt lousy and had to go to bed for a couple of days, then we would anticipate that, you know, with that six month gap, there wouldn't be a problem. Great. Um, and just another one in here. 
Um, should AstraZeneca be used if um, there has been myocarditis in the first dose of Pfizer given? Um, oh, that's what's second? currently being recommended, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and do we know if the booster vaccine will be affecting the traffic light system and our ability to go places? Um, do you think they'll be loaded up into our my vaccine passport? Certainly there's no intention to do that initially. Um, it might be that in six months time, it may be one of the reasons behind them issuing the passports for six months only. But at the moment we're being told it's not um, an issue. So it's not likely to be a problem over this um, summer. Great, thank you. Um, and just a question in here. So someone's had two doses of the Vice vaccine and then a positive PCR test. Um, should they receive a booster after six months once symptom free and cleared? Well, well, I think the research data would indicate that that person, um, although it was, you know, a shame that that happened, that they probably got absolutely fantastic boosting from their infection. And there's a lot of data now to show that people who had an infection before receiving a vaccine or, or had an infection after receiving a vaccine get much broader uh, uh, immune cover. You know, that's in contrast to people who've just had an infection, where we would say definitely that's not as good as having an infection plus a vaccine. But if it turns out that you've, you know, developed an infection despite having been vaccinated, that is probably, and there's a few early studies coming out to show this, um, actually means you've got much better immunity. Now, that wouldn't preclude you having another dose six months later, um, but, uh, you know, the chances are you're already in good shape. Great, thank you. Um, just uh, someone's popped up here basically saying that the CIR is set at uh, 183 days yeah. after the second dose. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we said from the comments yeah. before, so thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. Mm. Um, and just someone asking, is there any difference or worse side effects after the booster if you'd had a moderate reaction to the Pfizer vaccine? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I, I don't think we've got information about that. Uh, but but my, but my suspicion is that with that six month gap, it would probably all come out on the wash. Um, but for instance, I haven't actually seen, you know, definitive data about, you know, if you felt crook after the first vaccine, are you more likely to feel more crook after the second? I've certainly had lots of anecdotal experiences of people who felt pretty average after the first and had no problems after the second. So, so it's certainly not a guaranteed thing, but is there a kind of statistical higher chance? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. Great, thank you. Um, and just a question around um, the risk of myocarditis after the Pfizer booster compared to previous doses, especially in that younger um, male age group. Well, again, it's, you know, because, you know, even though it's a concern, it has been rare, even in that young male age group where it can be as high as one in seven or 8,000 after the second dose. Um, there just hasn't been enough uh, experience at this point in time um, with the third dose. You know, um, we, we're still not sure whether perhaps the, the risk of myocarditis is lower when you've had a bigger gap after between dose one and two. We still don't know that for sure. Um, and, and it's just too early to say what the situation might or might not be with the with a third dose after six months. But it's one of the important things that will need to be monitored carefully. Particularly, as I said, that the, the benefits in terms of enhanced protection, particularly against severe disease for that youngest age group are, are lowest. So given that, we'd obviously want to be really, you know, looking carefully at the safety you know, as well. So it's something that's important to look at, but I don't think we've got any, you know, definite answers at this point. Great, thank you. Okay, so a few people are asking for a, a new link for AstraZeneca webinar tomorrow. If anyone hasn't got the link, um, you should be able to, to um, apply again via our website or just email me um, directly and I'll make sure you get the link. Um, Booster um, dose is the same dose and strength as um, any other doses that we give with Pfizer. They're prepared and drawn up and administered in exactly the same way. Um, there isn't a written consent needed for a booster dose. So, so we're just covering a few of these quick ones on. Uh, Carol's so I've, telling I've you got to go soon. Is that, um, yeah, that's fine. That okay? that, have, have we covered most of the questions, do you think? Because I've got something covered. else happening. So That's fine. We don't normally run over anyway, so we're being a bit naughty yeah. catching your time. Okay. 
Okay, right. that's well, lovely. Well, I'm Thank sure you. we can, if there are any outstanding things, we can provide written answers in the chat later. Lisa, is that right? For people to be able to access those or? We certainly will be able to um, respond to questions. If people have still got questions, they can um, email us. Um, and the, I'm just thinking the best email is probably um, edcovid at um, imac, sorry, edcovid at auckland.ac.nz. Yeah. So um, edcovid at auckland.ac.nz. Thank you. Okay, Bye. thank you very much, Bye. Peter. Appreciate Bye -bye. it. Bye. Like, see, we've still got questions.